Story 1. My family and I went on holiday to Crete. We stayed at a lovely all-inclusive hotel, which was close to the beach. The food was decent, and there were drinks, a pool, and suns, basically all the fun things you could want. The hotel mainly catered to people from Denmark. Looking back, I don't actually remember seeing anyone else besides Danish people. I am from Denmark myself. There was a woman and her husband who also spent the week at the hotel during our stay. The husband was very quiet and seemed to be dragged around by his wife. We quickly got used to her constant complaints during dinner and her fussy manner of marching up to the young holiday guides at the hotel to nag at them. However, we didn't pay her much mind at first. My family and I love experiencing local culture. While exploring the city, we found a wonderful local restaurant on top of a tall hill at the back of the city. It wasn't even really a restaurant in the traditional sense. It was a Greek woman who cooked in her kitchen and let people eat on her terrace, which had a beautiful view of the sea. The setup was very humble, and the food was honest and amazing just delicious in every way. The woman was so caring and kind, constantly coming to interact with us. It was an amazing experience, so we ended up eating at her place a couple of times during the week. One night, as we were returning to the hotel, the woman we'd been noticing came marching up to us. Her, how dare you? Us, what? Her, you have paid for your all-inclusive meals, and then you don't even eat dinner here. Us, we paid for it, so we can do what we want with it. If we want to eat somewhere else, we can do that. Her, don't you think that's a massive waste? Us, we're sure the hotel is used to it. Her, well, I think it's disrespectful, and you ought to know better. We just laughed and walked away from her. The next day, we learned that she and her husband had booked a hike through a gorge Samaria Gorge, I believe it was called. The hike takes you through a nature area, and you end up in a rural village that is only accessible either by walking there or taking a boat. After reaching the village, you take a boat and then a bus to get back to the hotel. However, neither she nor her husband were exactly fit for such an adventure. We know what happened because they were missing at breakfast the following morning. When they eventually arrived, her mood was so foul that the entire hotel could feel it. Later, we saw a very shaken hotel guide, a young girl probably around 18-20 years old, who had come to comfort her. The guide explained the story. Apparently, during the hike, both the woman and her husband had reached their physical limits halfway through and were too far in to turn back. They had to wait for a couple of donkeys from the rural village to come and pick them up carrying them to the end destination. Unfortunately, when they finally arrived at the village, the last boat had already left, so they had to rent a hotel room for the night at an exorbitant price. The next morning, they took the boat and then the bus back to the hotel. After that incident, although the woman still carried a stormy demeanor for the rest of the holiday, we didn't hear much more from her. She and her husband kept to themselves in the corners and were much quieter. I do feel sorry for them, as they ended up ruining their own holiday. But I'm glad they didn't ruin ours and instead gave us a lot to laugh about. It must be hard to be that entitled, and my thoughts go out to her poor husband. Story 2. A bit of history. In the fall of 2005, my significant other and I bought our first house together. We were thrilled. We had a baby on the way and the house was charming, located in a new subdivision where a homeowners association had just been formed. We were at the end of a quiet cul-de-sac with no traffic. The neighbors were friendly. The economy takes a turn. About three years later, the United States economy took a nosedive. Over half of the homes in our subdivision were foreclosed on or in the process of being so. My significant other and I couldn't keep up with our mortgage payments either, so we moved out allowing a family friend and his family, who had lost their home, to move in. He paid us a discounted rent, which we used to maintain the house, even though we weren't paying the mortgage. The homeowners association was struggling to maintain the common areas and keep the place clean due to a lack of funds. Abandoned cars and dying landscaping were everywhere. One home even burned down to its foundation. The Fire Lane Incident A few months after my friend moved in, 
The curbs in all the cul-de-sacs of the subdivision were painted red, indicating fire lanes. I was infuriated because this meant no street parking in front of the house. Any time I needed to stop by to fix something, or if my tenant had a guest, we had to park in front of a neighbor's house or on the common collector streets and walk in. I called the local fire department to ask why they needed so many fire lanes, especially since there were no fire hydrants nearby. They told me they hadn't requested additional fire lanes or curb painting. They explained that anyone could paint a curb red, but it's the presence of signage or a hydrant that legally designates it as a fire lane. The paint is just there to help interpret the signage. I checked, and sure enough, there were no signs. It turns out this was a tactic by the homeowners association to generate more funds. If they painted curbs red and called it a safety zone, their bylaws allowed them to fine homeowners for violating the safety zone. Conveniently, the homeowners association president lived at the end of one of the cul-de-sacs, and now her neighbors could no longer park in front of her house without getting fined. Taking action. One evening, just after twilight, I put on a high-visibility vest, safety glasses, and work boots and painted over the red curb with a plain gray paint, specifically designed for concrete with excellent coverage. I did the entire cul-de-sac. Three weeks later, it was red again. Two days after that, it was gray. Five weeks later, red. Then gray with a silicone top sealer. Then red again, which flaked off almost immediately. Then another coat of red that flaked again. Finally, they put up a sign that read, Safety Zone No Parking, Foreclosure and Short Sale. Due to non-payment, the home was now under notification of foreclosure, and I was working with an agency to help navigate and file all the necessary paperwork to short sell the house. In a short sale, the bank agrees to forgive any amount we owe as long as we turn the house over in good condition. This was a hard pill to swallow but it was better than owing $350,000 on a house worth only $165,000 that would soon be legally taken from us. During the short sale process, you are required to notify any potential parties that could have liens on the house, including the homeowners association. I was up to date on my dues and had no outstanding violations, so I thought I was in the clear. But no, the homeowners association suddenly came up with a whole list of violations that hadn't been addressed for five months, plus additional fines for the delay. They claimed to have notified me in November, but couldn't produce any copies of these supposed notices. They only had the current one, listing all the outstanding violations in March. The violations. The violations included black stains on the driveway, an uncoiled garden hose, an unapproved tree, a missing bush, missing foliage, and a dead tree. I informed them that the stains were tire marks from driving into the garage. The unapproved tree was something they had approved, and the missing bushes had also been approved for removal. I had copies of the plans and their approvals, with their signatures on them. It wasn't my fault they didn't know what they had approved. As for the dead tree, many trees lose their leaves in the fall, around November. They might appear dead if someone is just making up violations in February, but they were just dormant, waiting for spring. Even if the tree had been dead, you can't replace a tree in November, December, January, or February. No nurseries sell saplings that late in the season unless you want a holiday tree. How could anyone reasonably expect to replace a dead tree in the off-season? The Homeowners Association's Last Move The Homeowners Association delayed responding, and the short sale was on a timer. If I didn't have all the legal items, payments for liens, and documents into the escrow officer by a specific date, the short sale would fall through, and I would owe $350,000 plus interest on a $165,000 house that was soon to be foreclosed on. The Homeowners Association fines and fees totaled $1,955, just $1.45 short of where felony fraud starts. I was livid. This homeowners association was going to get one last dig in, and I would be the one paying for it. A plan. So, I spoke to the escrow officer to see what she needed. Only the money for the homeowners association, Leon, and you'll close escrow tomorrow, she said. She had seen many of these short sales with similar amounts of fines requested by homeowners associations that hold up the process. 
none exceeded $2,000. I asked her what form of payment would satisfy her as an escrow officer. Money order, cash, or check. A check would be easiest for you, don't you think? She replied. So, if I write a check to the homeowners association for $1,955, then hand it to you, that'll satisfy escrow? Yep, she said. You'll mail the check to the homeowners association after the documents are recorded, I asked. Yes, she confirmed. You'll have a check in 25 minutes, I replied. The next day. The next day, I was on the phone with the escrow officer, sitting in my car in a parking lot. It was 9.01 m. Did the documents record? Did the short sale go through? I asked. Yes. I'll mail out finalized documents and any other items before the close of business today, she said. Thank you, I replied, and hung up. I walked into the local branch of my bank and informed the teller, I need to place a stop payment on a check. Aftermath. And the homeowners association never tried to collect or contact us again. Story 3 so, I have to share this story because it's too ridiculous not to and random Redditors may appreciate it. Today, I went to the local outlet mall to treat myself to some new shoes. I was sitting on the bench and putting my shoes back on after trying some new pairs on. I heard some ruckus and noticed this family parents and three kids walk by. The kids were acting out and being loud. They had taken the metal poles that staff used to get the shoes from the higher shelves and trying to hit poke their parents with them. The mom was laughing about it and egging them on. Typical boys will be boys stuff. As I was bending over to adjust my sandal, one of the kids swung the pole and nearly hit me in the face. I worked with kids with severe behavioral issues for years, so I was a little shaken but knew how to respond. I quietly but firmly said excuse me to the kid so he'd get that thing out of my face. The kid barely blinked and walked away. Then the mother started shouting at me. I'm not normally the type to stereotype based on appearance, but she was the typical boy mom you see on social media face full of filler, dirty hair in a messy bun, orange tan, etc. She began screaming that her son wasn't even near me and that her kids weren't doing anything. I pointed out that her kid nearly hit me in the face with a metal pole. She turned to her kid and started baby talking him, saying, You did nothing wrong, she's making it up, etc., etc. She turned to me again and screamed that I could have moved. I rolled my eyes at the absurdity and started gathering my stuff to pay. She continued to shout things like, Get out, move along, you should have moved, etc. I decided that there was no point in being polite, so I calmly said, And perhaps you should be a parent and watch your kids. She continued to shout at me as I walked away. As I was waiting to pay, I saw her lurking by the door with her 300-pound stroller and glaring at me. I started laughing, like she's gonna beat me down in a shoe outlet in broad daylight. That must have pissed her off, so she walked away. I assumed she was gone, but when I left the store her creepy husband was standing outside and staring me down. He followed me around the mall for a minute, but I eventually lost him. As I mentioned earlier, I worked with kids with severe behavior issues, including in a juvenile justice setting. I left that field not because of the kids, but because of the parents. From what I understand, it's become exponentially worse over the years. Going out in public used to be enjoyable, but I feel like people not supervising their kids is starting to become a broader societal issue. It felt so freeing to finally call out shitty parenting. Story 4. I'm a 28-year-old graphic designer, and I've always had a thing for witty t-shirts. My latest purchase was this shirt that said, Not Today Karen, in bold letters. I bought it mostly as a joke after dealing with one too many difficult clients at work. You know the type always demanding the impossible and treating you like you're beneath them. Anyway, I decided to wear this shirt out to my favorite sushi place. It's a small, casual joint that I've been going to for years. The food is amazing, and the staff is always friendly. I figured it'd be a nice, relaxing evening. Boy, was I wrong. I walked into the restaurant, and everything seemed normal at first. 
I was seated at my usual spot near the window, scrolling through my phone, while waiting for the waiter to come take my order. That's when I heard it a shrill voice that made me want to crawl under the table. Woman, excuse me. Yes, you. I looked up, thinking maybe I had dropped something. Instead, I saw this middle-aged woman stomping towards me, her face red with anger. She was dragging a teenage boy behind her, who looked like he wanted to disappear into thin air. Woman, how dare you wear such an offensive shirt in public? There are children here. Me, I'm sorry, what? Woman, don't play dumb with me. That shirt is completely inappropriate. I glanced down at my, not today Karen shirt, then back at her, suddenly realizing the irony of the situation. Me, ma'am, it's just a funny shirt. It's not hurting anyone. Woman, it's promoting hate speech against women named Karen. My best friend is named Karen, and she's a lovely person. By this point, everyone in the restaurant was staring at us. The teenage boy with her probably her son was trying to pull her away. Boy, mom, please, let's just go sit down. Woman, no, I won't let this stand. Before I could even process what was happening, she reached out and shoved me. Hard. I nearly fell out of my chair. Me, hey, don't touch me. Woman, take that shirt off right now. Me, lady, you need to back off. What you're doing right now is exactly why I'm wearing this shirt. I thought maybe pointing out the irony would make her realize how ridiculous she was being. Instead, it was like I had poured gasoline on a fire. Woman, how dare you? I am a paying customer, and I demand respect. She raised her hand, clearly intending to slap me. I flinched, but before she could make contact, someone grabbed her wrist. It was the restaurant owner, a kind older man who I'd gotten to know over the years. Owner, that's enough. I'm going to have to ask you to leave. Woman, what? But he's the one causing trouble. Owner, ma'am, you've assaulted another customer and caused a disturbance. Please leave now, or I'll be forced to call the police. The woman's face turned an even deeper shade of red. For a moment, I thought she might actually explode. Woman, this is outrageous. I'll sue this entire establishment. You haven't heard the last of me. She stormed out, practically dragging her mortified son behind her. The rest of the restaurant burst into applause as the door slammed shut. The owner turned to me, concern etched on his face. Owner, are you all right? Do you need me to call the police? I was shaken, but mostly just in shock at what had happened. Me? No, I'm okay. Thank you for stepping in. Owner, of course. Your meal is on the house tonight. As I sat there, trying to process everything, the teenage boy who had been with the woman came back into the restaurant. He looked absolutely mortified. Boy, I'm so sorry about my mom. She's... she's got some issues. Me, it's not your fault, kid. Are you okay? Boy, yeah, I'm fine. Just embarrassed. I told her to wait in the car while I came back to apologize. Me, that's really mature of you. Thanks. The boy nodded, then hurried out of the restaurant. I couldn't help but feel bad for him, stuck with a mom like that. The rest of my meal was surprisingly pleasant. Several other customers came over to check on me and share their own crazy customer stories. By the time I left, I was feeling much better about the whole thing. As I was walking to my car, I saw the woman and her son in the parking lot. She was in the middle of what looked like an intense phone call, probably trying to complain to someone about the terrible service she had received. When she saw me, her eyes narrowed, and she started marching in my direction. But before she could reach me, a police car pulled into the lot, lights flashing. Apparently, someone in the restaurant had called them after all. The woman's face went from anger to panic in an instant. I decided to take the high road. I gave her a small wave and a have a nice evening before getting in my car and driving away. As I pulled out of the lot, I saw her trying to explain herself to the officers, gesticulating wildly. In the end, I guess my shirt was right. It really wasn't her day. Story 5 I recently stumbled upon a family story that I barely managed to piece together. It's about my mother, 
who passed away in 2023, and her mother, my grandmother. Since I don't know the actual conversations, I'm going to approximate them. Tell me, does this seem like entitlement? Let's go back to 1979. My mom was 16 at the time, living at home in a household of 10 people, two parents, four siblings, and four adult relatives. My grandmother's husband earned a decent amount working at the factory, and the other relatives contributed financially as well. So, no one was struggling for money. My mom had just been hired at a fast food restaurant, you know the one with the golden arches. She caught on quickly and developed a strong work ethic. She balanced her schoolwork, friends, and family commitments without letting her grades slip. When my mom received her first paycheck, she was ecstatic. She had big plans, considering it was the late 1970s and the 1980s were around the corner. She was dreaming about eight tracks, tapes, and records. She was a happy teenager until she got home. After announcing her first paycheck, my grandmother pulled her aside and said, Hey kiddo, I know you're excited, but I need your help with the household expenses. My mother made a frustrated noise. But mom, what about the senior trip in two years? I wanted to have fun with the money I earned. But her mother went stern. I know, honey, but we need to think of the family and household. Eventually, my grandmother guilt tripped my mother into signing over her paycheck. Just to provide some context, the minimum wage was $2.90 at the time, so her paychecks were in the $118 to $127 range. That was still a lot of money for a young teenager in the 1970s and 1980s. Seeing the disappointment on my mother's face, my grandmother offered, Tell you what, my bank has these huge interest rates going on. I'm thinking I can put half your paycheck into an account. You can collect your rainy day money later. My mom thought it was a good enough deal, and my grandmother even gave her $5 as an allowance. After a year of signing over her money, my mom wanted to see what she had saved up so far. However, my grandmother refused to show her the account. My mom became a little suspicious but still had some faith in her. That trust was shattered six months later when my mom discovered the truth. She found a monthly statement from my grandmother no special account existed. My mom confronted her mother, and my grandmother essentially admitted, Your adult siblings aren't doing well. I wanted to send them care packages each week. I split the money up between them and sent it. I was going to pay you back eventually. My grandmother said this in a matter-of-fact tone. My mom couldn't believe what her mother had just confessed. She was 17, nearly 18, at the time. My mother softly asked, but what if I wanted to leave or go to college, or... My grandmother interrupted in a gentle tone. I figured you'd stay at your job for the time being, since you weren't actively looking for colleges or trying to do anything other than have fun, I figured you'd stick it out here at the house. My mom responded with a bit of attitude, which led to a heated argument. My grandmother snapped. If you're going to get sassy with me, young lady, you can just move out any time. Angry with her mother, my mom began secretly packing her things. She moved out and crashed on a friend's couch. She was happier to hear that her friend was offering her a full room. The best part? My mom got to keep her entire paycheck but had to learn how to budget and pay her bills. She worked overtime but had fun along the way, and she even got two promotions. Two years later, by which time she had been dating my father for a year, my mom received an interesting call from the police. Apparently, a woman had been going from bank to bank with my mom's information, asking if her daughter had an account there. The police officer told my mom, This woman has your social security number, your birth certificate, and most of your personal information. She claims to be your mother. Could you come down to the station to identify her? My mom rolled her eyes and walked down to the police station. It was within walking distance, so no big deal. At that time, there were only four banks in town, one being a credit union and another a farmer's union. The officers shook her hand upon arrival and thanked her for coming down. My mom had never seen her mother like this sitting on the floor of a jail cell. According to the police, my grandmother had been demanding information about her daughter and then the status of her accounts. When she became hysterical and stormed out, the police picked her up. 
They wanted to know if my mom wanted to press charges for attempted fraud. My mom asked them to hold off for a moment. She then asked my grandmother, You could have just popped by my job, you know? My grandmother barely replied, Look, um, well, I was looking for you, and after you ran away, I... My grandmother couldn't finish her sentence, clearly embarrassed. My mom looked at her mother solemnly, wishing something like this had never happened. My grandmother started again. Everyone was asking about you and what you were up to. The household is so quiet. My mom had one question. Mom, why did you need to know if I had an account at whichever bank I was with? Your name wasn't on the account, so I don't understand. My grandmother didn't answer. My mom walked away, surprised, in shock, and disbelief. She held herself together as she walked out to the police officer. She told them to release my grandmother, pressing no charges on the condition that my grandmother return all the documents she had taken. Afterward, my mom went no contact for five years. My grandmother eventually tracked her down small town, and she followed her home. By that time, my mom had her first child, my eldest sibling, and was expecting her second. She was married by then. My mom forgave her mother. It was a slow process to rebuild the relationship and trust, but eventually, they became close again. My mom remained close to her mother until her passing in the 2000s. Story 6 I will try to keep this short as I am on my phone taking a break from cleaning up. A couple of things have happened, so I will try to sum it all up. Dulce came by the next day after my last post. She was sheepish and embarrassed and pulled me into the living room to talk. She then apologized a lot. She said she panicked, made a scene, and put me on the spot. Then she said, I'm such a drama queen, and laughed but that was a put-down my dad used on her. I just snapped and launched into this whole verbal outburst. I don't remember all that I said, but the key points were that she's not a drama queen. Dad used that term to belittle her, and I've noticed she's been doing that a lot since his death, using words to put herself down as a sort of self-deprecating humor, which is fine unless she really believes it. I told her that I've been doing the same to myself internally, and it's not healthy. I explained a bit about how I was feeling loved but lonely all at once and trying to balance the pain and shame felt like a full-time job. Dad's voice is in my head, berating and putting me down constantly. I likened it to a show she likes, where the character sort of hallucinates his adversary, and she laughed. Then, I simply came clean about the letter, what I did, and why. I basically said everything from my last post. It hurt me to see her hurting so much and it was almost like I was overflowing with all the love I never allowed myself to feel for her as my little sister. I got protective, scared, and selfishly wanted to end her pain so I could stop feeling it. Her strength is that she lives and feels so deeply all the time that it's infectious. I still lack the emotional intelligence and tools to feel in a healthy way. I apologize to her for all of this throughout the whole thing, just blurting it all out, without even realizing it. I had started to cry through the last bits. I told her I love her so much, not just because of all the comfort and joy she gives me, but because my blinders and dad are gone, and I can see what a kind, caring, sweet, and vibrant person she is. This mistake, this awful mistake, was such a slap in the face of her forceful trust in me that I am scared it will be the last straw, and she will cut me out once and for all, and I wouldn't blame her. I said that if she couldn't forgive me and wanted me to leave her alone from now on, I would respect it. But I really hope she can forgive me so we can continue to bond and make up for all that lost time Dad stole from us, and I can make up for my own hand in her pain. She listened to me go on and on, crying as well. Then she just jumped at me and hugged me, and we cried together for a while. I can't explain the feeling. I was so relieved, sad, grateful, angry a thousand things I don't have names for. She forgave me and said that once she had calmed down at work that day and really thought about it, she realized it was odd that she would just drunkenly go into my study and put the letter in the drawer. She came to suspect that I might have put it there, but didn't have the courage to confront me. As she was scared, I would double down I was known to do that, blow up, and cut her out. 
We made a promise to never abandon one another, to really be family from now on, and to talk things out when we get scared or feel overwhelmed. I brought up the prospect of us burning the letter together, and she did hesitate at that idea at first. I didn't push, but we had dinner and watched some TV, and she eventually spoke up, saying that she's not ready to destroy it yet. The words are hurtful, and it breaks her every time she reads it, but it's his last words to her. She said he usually talked around her or outright ignored her, unless he was saying something hurtful or ordering her around. But at the end of the letter, it says, Love, Dad, and she can't remember him saying he loved her or calling himself her dad just dad, no step. And it's hard to let go of that. We agreed to get group therapy with our other sister to talk through all this, and she will work with her therapist in her one-on-one -on -one sessions to let go of the letter. She liked the idea of eventually burning it thankfully, but just not quite yet. She apologized again, and I sort of laughed. She looked horrified, so I had to quickly explain that she should not be apologizing for any of this. All of this trouble has been done to her, but I love that she is so sweet and so willing to say sorry so often. It astounds me because up until a few months ago, I was constitutionally incapable of such a word or accepting blame. I find it hard, and she does it so easily. But I hope she someday gets to a place where she can stand tall and wait for a deserved apology, rather than throw herself under a bus she didn't deserve. I ruffled her hair, and she was smiling like a kid. It felt like a real moment with my little sister a genuine, simple moment. I cherish it even as I type this. We did call our youngest sister and explained what was happening, and if she'd be willing to go to the therapy session with us. She didn't seem overly keen, but simply asked for the when and where. We looked up appointments on the online portal, as we all see our therapists from the same group, and booked a slot for Friday evening. Baby sister did admit to wanting to talk stuff out with us and feeling hurt by us both and by our moms, that everyone just seems to be glad he's dead. We said we can talk all about it and are open to hearing her side of things. I think we have a real shot at working this out as a family. We just needed to be honest about our feelings. If I update about this, I will try to just add it to the bottom of this existing post, since we're two posted updates in, and brevity, it seems, is no longer a skill I possess. Ha! Ah. In the meantime, be good to each other, love one another, and enjoy every moment with those you love and who love you. Thanks so much. Asterisk, asterisk, update, asterisk, asterisk. Sorry, I know I said the last was the final but I got frustrated trying to edit in an update on my last post here. Also, sorry for my brain fog in giving my stepsister two names, I wasn't a Reddit person before all of this, so the fake name thing is throwing me off, but I will go back to the original name I gave her, Daph. I don't remember if I gave my baby sister a name, so for this, I will call her Sarah. Our Friday therapy appointment was over three hours. There were a lot of tears, Sarah went first, and she said that she is feeling abandoned by us because we're suddenly so close, and she feels we are leaving her behind when she needs us most. She hates that we almost seem glad Dad is gone. We talked through it, and Daff ended up reading his letter aloud. I think it might have been the first time she did so because she broke down several times. Then she read a part that lives in my mind. Dad had written, You could have had potential. Your mother is exceptional, but you made choices, Daphne. You're a big girl now, so I won't try to protect your feelings. You failed at everything you've ever done. I'm fatigued by trying to make you strong and useful. You're too broken for me to pity now. Sarah was devastated and kept saying that this couldn't be from Dad, that he wouldn't say such things. The therapist helped explain that he was a good and loving father to her, but not to us. She's mourning the memories of a loving father while we are processing the loss of an abuser. It broke my heart as I watched her break right there. Daff went next, and she was so brave. She shared how the letter was his last words to her, and they are as hard to let go of as they are to read, and that love, Dad, at the end was the only thing she could hold on to. I suggested the burning ceremony so many of you brought up, and we talked about it. Daff initially disliked the idea, but the therapist helped us discuss how to somehow let this letter go. 
In the end, she did agree. We called the moms, and they also wanted to be there for this. We had it yesterday at my fire pit in my yard. There were enough pages that each of us had at least one page to burn it totaled nine pages front and back in a half page. I have to thank you for all your ideas because I managed to make two of them happen. First, unbeknownst to Daff before that moment, we all wrote replacement letters for her, read them aloud, and then handed them to her. When I read mine, I share the feelings I've expressed in my past few posts and told her how proud I am of her and how strong she is. She makes me want to be a better man, a better son, and a better brother. She is the soul of our family, and by the end of my reading my letter, she and I were both just unglued, crying our eyes out. Then we gave her the gift, okayed by the therapist, thanks to the kind commenter who came up with it. My biological mother does crafts and jewelry with resin and other materials. She took the one clip of love, dad, and made a necklace out of it. I had to hold Daff up. She was crying so hard. I've never heard a wail like that before. We burned our pages of those miserable words, hugged, and cried. The moms then piled us into their two cars, and we had dinner together. There was a point when I looked around at my sisters, and they were laughing and smiling and joking around. I wish I had a snapshot of that exact moment because I knew that we would be okay. Better than okay, we were going to be epic. Not right away, of course, but someday. Daft decided not to take the overseas internship and confessed to me that she only originally took it because she needed to run. When her fight or flight response kicks in, she wants so badly to choose flight. It's an old habit she adopted to survive years of mistreatment, and it's hard to give up. She instead wants to go back to school and focus on rebuilding her mental health. I said that was a great idea, and she is welcome to stay at my place rent-free so she can focus her income on school. I haven't told her yet, but I've spoken with the moms, and we can collectively pay for a good chunk of tuition for four years if she will let us. My stepmom, Daff's biological mother, will help us cover the house expenses so she can finish school without more debt. I'm so proud of my sisters and proud of myself and so annoyingly giddy. I know the elation will pass and the hard work isn't going anywhere, but this is the first time in a very long time that I can say I truly and deeply feel happy.